Well, good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are <clears throat> so thankful that you chose to, to worship with us this morning. If you are new here, <clears throat> there are connect, we would love to connect with you. There are connection cards in the seat back in front of you. And we have some information at the welcome desk. We'll have information about worship times, kids programs, small groups, and, and events. If you have any questions or want to connect with Emmanuel, please stop by the welcome desk in the cafe. Um, we are thankful for this time to get together in worship. Um, and we are in a season of preparing for Easter. Uh, I have a couple announcements related to that. On this, this Friday, or this Saturday, March 25th, we will have a work day to kind of spruce up, freshen up our campus. So if you would like to join, Butch Raber is the contact for that. We'll be here at eight from about 8 to 10 on Saturday morning. But bring yard tools, bring rakes, <clears throat> blowers, weed eaters, gloves, shovels, wheelbarrows, things like that to make our campus ready for when we when we have guests visit on Easter. Just in and also thinking about Easter, we have some Easter invitations. Pick them pick up one of the Easter invitations and take it to a friend, someone who you've always wanted to invite to join us at Emmanuel. Invite them to Easter. That's a great time for them to come and hear the gospel and hear about what new life in Christ as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord on Easter. On Easter, we're going to have an Easter choir. Um, if, you are, if you can sing and are interested in joining the choir and helping lead in worship on a special way, please sign up for the Easter choir. You can sign up on the, through the Church Center app or you can sign up on ebccrestview.com. If you, are int if you don't have a great voice but want to serve at Easter time in different ways, there are many opportunities. We are hoping to have a packed house at both services and in the overflow room. So we'll, we, we will need extra greeters. We will need extra child care workers. We'll need <clears throat> extra people on safety team. So if you are interested in volunteering, see some of the leaders in the hangar or in Discovery Park or see me. My name is Michael. I'm here on staff. You can see me and I can help you get pointed in the right direction, whatever your giftings are. We hope that we have lots of visitors on Easter and we want to get ready for that. Another thing is this Friday, we will have our joy group lunch at 11 o'clock in the cafe. If you are over the age of 60, you are welcome to join in a time of great food and good fellowship um, <clears throat> uh, this, this Friday. Dr. Jumper is traveling this weekend, but we have a guest speaker. Ben Baber is here. He is currently the college minister at Shades Mountain Baptist in Birmingham. We're excited to hear what God has laid on, laid on his heart to, to share us. Many of you know Ben. Ben grew up in Emmanuel, so he's excited uh, to, to come back and preach God's word to us this morning. He also wanted me to tell you that he is now the world record holder in someone who can eat 100 hot wings in under 30 minutes. So congratulate that, him on that. that. That may or may not be true, but he, he did ask me to say that. So. But we're excited about worshiping. Today we want to worship by singing songs, by prayer, and by hearing from God's word. We are, when we come to church, we're expectant that God will speak to us. So let me pray for us and we will continue in worship. Father God, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for giving us this day. We thank you for calling us to yourself to worship you, God. We pray that as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us as you promised. God, we pray that you would speak to us, speak to us through your word. We pray that you would encourage us to not focus on ourselves, but to focus on others. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. EBC, how are we doing this morning? Good, good. Awesome. As the lights come up, I get to see your beautiful faces. I'm so excited to be with you guys this morning. Like they said, my name is Ben. Uh, just, I, I feel very honored to be here with you guys. This is the church that I was baptized at. 
This is a church where I started my ministry and, and so many people sitting in the room today are, uh, they made me the man who I am today and the pastor who I am for better or for worse. Um, and so I'm grateful for you guys and, and it truly is uh, such a great honor. I'm thankful to Dr. Jumper for inviting me to preach here this morning. I want to start this morning with a question. And the question is this, as humans, do we love stories about people who are willing to lay it on the line for others? We'd probably all agree with that. We love those kinds of stories, right? We see sports, we see in movies, we see in books, we see all these different examples of people who are willing to lay it on the line for others. Think of movies like Saving Private Ryan. Think of movies like Titanic, we got the Avengers, we got Star Wars, maybe if you want something a little, you know, more fantasy or whatnot. <laughs> but we love these stories. We love these stories because what they are for us is a beautiful picture of what it means to bear another's burdens, even when it comes at a great cost to us. And we're going to see this morning from Scripture that bearing one another's burdens is not just something to make good movies. It's not just something that makes good stories, but that it is something that has been done for us by God, and now we are called by God to go and do, the other, do for others the same. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10, and as you're turning there, I'll give us a little bit of context for where we're at. The, the book of Galatians is actually a letter written to the churches in the area of Galatia by the Apostle Paul. And he has uh, planted these churches, and then after his first missionary journey, he's writing back to them. And, and as is a pretty normal experience, and was a pretty normal experience for these first century churches, they had fallen victim to false teaching. They had fallen victim to false teaching, and, and, and Paul has planted these churches, they've been growing, and now they've had false teaching, and so he is writing to them to remind them of what the good news of Jesus is. So what were the false teaching that they had fallen victim to? It was that they needed Jesus plus something. Okay, so the, there were these people called the Judaizers, and they were teaching that Christ alone wasn't enough to be a Christian, but then in order to be a Christian, you needed Jesus plus keeping the Jewish customs. And obviously, we know that's wrong. And that's what gets Paul so fired up, so passionate to write this letter to the churches in the area is because they were being taught something that was pulling them away from Jesus. And so in the first two chapters of the book of Galatians, Paul is just simply reminding them of what the gospel is. And then in chapters 3 and 4, Paul is showing them that through the gospel of Jesus, God is creating this multi-ethnic family of both Jews and Gentiles. And then we get into chapters 5 and 6, which is where we'll be today. God is, uh, Paul is showing them that through the gospel of Jesus, the Holy Spirit transforms people from the inside out. So that's where we're going to be at today. So as is custom here at EBC, if you guys would stand with me as we read the Word of God. It is the only unshakable foundation upon which the people of God can stand. And that's why we stand at the reading. I'll read for us. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. You guys can have a seat. 
What I want you to hear this morning, and I believe it's what Paul is telling us, is that Christ-like burden bearing leads to an abundant harvest. Let me say that again. Christ-like burden bearing leads to an abundant harvest. And so we're going to start by breaking down this idea of burden bearing. Verse 1 says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. This first word in this verse is brothers. And it's not just a throwaway term. It's not something that we can just gloss over because what Paul is doing here is he's making the assumption that if you have a desire to grow in what it means to love Jesus, Paul is making the assumption that you are a part of a faith family. And it's important for us to be reminded, we don't grow in our love for Jesus outside of the context of a faith family. And what is that? It's the church. It's the church. It's the people sitting in the pews with you this morning. In fact, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad I'm in your faith family. <laughs> say it with emphasis. You're excited about it. <laughs> and we have to start with this. We have to start with this because God has given us the church. He's given us a family as a means of grace to remind us and to help us grow in what it means to look more and more like Jesus. And as many of you know this morning, sometimes that's awesome. And sometimes it's really hard to be a part of a family. But we have to have it. We have to have it. Paul also tells us here in verse 1 that at times our church family will wander. They'll get caught up in sin. And so my question is, are we actually concerned about that? Do we even care? See, it's okay in your social clubs for people to come and go. That's fine. But in the family of God, with brothers and sisters, co-heirs with Jesus, adopted by God the Father, it's got to be different. What do we do when people walk away? What do we do when people are caught up in sin? We restore. The word restore here means to put back into place. It's the same word used for talking about the resetting of a fractured bone. If you've ever broken a bone, you know it's not fun when they reset that thing, is it? No, it hurts. It does not feel good. But it is good. And it's right. So it is with restoration. It'll probably be inconvenient. It'll probably cost you something. But if we don't do it, we leave ourselves open to the unhealthy healing that might come, which could cause problems in the future. My dad always says, you can either pay now for your health, or you can pay later with interest. So it is with restoration. The longer that you wait, the harder and harder and harder it becomes. And just like broken bones take time to heal... Restoration takes time, it takes time. And so we've got to be patient when entering into it, but we've got to be eager to enter into it. Unfortunately, Paul doesn't give us explicit instructions on how to perform a restoration. There's no YouTube video here for us to watch, but he does tell us what a restore should be like. He tells us what a restore should be like. And he says this, first, they should be spiritual. They should be spiritual. Spiritual people pray. Spiritual people are constantly seeking to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual people always keep the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for them on the cross, at the forefront of their minds. So if we want to be people who restore people, we've got to start first by being spiritual people. Second, people who are restoring people should be gentle. They should be gentle. Now I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not a very gentle person. I can be gentle with my stuff and, you know, books and dishes and things like that. But when it comes to people's feelings, I'm not always great with that. And I'm learning that about my son as well. He's not a very gentle person. My youngest son, I'll go to kiss him on the face and he'll just smack me. And it's like, he thinks it's hilarious. I'm like, dude, be gentle. 
Maybe if you've got little kids, you know how that goes too, or they'll just scratch you and you think it's not, you're like, oh, they're going to be so sweet, and they're not. So just like he's got to learn to be gentle, I've got to, be, to learn to be gentle because if I want to be a restoring person, I have to be a gentle person. Third, people who are restoring people need to be watchful. They need to be watchful. Is that watchful of others? No, it's watchful of themselves. It can be pretty easy to get caught up in other people's sin and to focus on other people's sin. And a lot of times when we do that, we lose sight of our own sin. That's what Paul is talking about here. It's what Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, how do you notice the the speck of dust in your brother's eye and yet don't notice the log in your own? We have to be watchful of ourselves and our propensity to sin because we may get caught up in it ourselves in our desire to help other people. And so people who restore people have to be spiritual. They have to be watchful. And they have to be gentle people. And that leads us into verse 2. Here's what Paul says. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We said it earlier. Restoration isn't always convenient. It's not always fun. But it's good. And it's right. And in one sense, restoration is the bearing of someone else's burden. A burden that they have caused because of their own sin. We also know there's other types of burden bearing. There's bearing somebody's burden who's been sinned against by somebody. There's also the bearing of burdens because someone just finds themselves in a hard life circumstance that they would not have chosen. Any way that you spin it though... We all have burdens that we need help in bearing. There is not a single person in this room this morning who doesn't have a need for help in carrying their load in some way. How do I know this? Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world marred by the effects of sin. And that's why burden bearing is a ministry that every single Christian is called to. It's not just for the professional Christians. It's not just for the pastors and the counselors, but every single person who calls themselves a Christ follower is called to burden bearing. And it's in that that we see here in verse two that we fulfill the law of Christ. We fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? John Stott, a biblical commentator, says this. The law of Christ is to love one another as he loves us. That was the new commandment which he gave. What is Stott referencing here? What's what's the verse that he's referencing here? John chapter 13, 34. Here's what Jesus says to us. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Stott goes on to say, It is very impressive that to love your neighbor, carry each other's burdens, and fulfill the law are three equivalent expressions. It shows that to love one another as Christ loves us may lead us not to some heroic, spectacular deed of self-sacrifice, but to the much more mundane and unspectacular ministry of burden bearing. If you're walking around at the airport and you're making your way from, you know, your gate to your other gate, if you see somebody struggling with heavy luggage, do you just walk past them and say, oh, that's not my problem? No. You'd stop, and you'd help them. And if we'll do that there, how much more important is it within the family of God, amongst people who have been forgiven by the God of the universe, to help one another bear each other's burdens? If we can't do it, then who can And what might that look like? What might it look like to to help someone bear their burdens? It can be super practical. Maybe you've got that neighbor, older person. Maybe their spouse just passed away and, and you could go sit at their house because they're feeling super lonely. Maybe it's taking a meal to somebody who you know is going through a tough time. In fact, when we first came to this church 25 years ago, our family was going through a tough time. We'd only been here for one week. We'd only been here for one week and there were some sweet ladies who brought a meal to our house because my grandfather wasn't good. That's who EBC is, is a caring people. 
What are some other things? Maybe you're a teenager in the room today and you've got the friend who you know their home life is not great. Maybe it's inviting them over to your house for just a little while so that they can get away from the mess at their own house. Or maybe it's offering to babysit for that young couple with those young kids. I'm, this is very personal to me. I've got little kids. If you want to babysit them, you call me up. We will bring them to your house that second. <laughs> But in all seriousness, there are so many good opportunities for us to bear another's burdens. We just have to be on the constant lookout for doing it. And while there are so many good opportunities, there's something that might be holding us back. And what is that something? It's pride. Verse 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You got to love Paul here. There's no mincing of words. He'll just cut right to the chase. He says, If someone thinks they're too important to stoop to the level of carrying another's burdens, they're a liar. That's pretty direct. He says, Not only are they lying to other people, they're lying to themselves. See, pride always gets in the way of bearing burdens. Both bearing the burdens of other people, but then being willing to ask people to help you bear your own burdens. Timothy George, a a biblical commentator, says this. He talks about the myth myth of self-sufficiency. He says, The myth of self-sufficiency is not a mark of bravery, but rather a sign of pride. That's hard as Americans to hear. Paul is telling us here that if a man thinks that he is somebody, just by the very thought, he proves that he's a nobody. Thinking you're somebody, just by the very thought, you prove that you're a nobody. If you're not interested in helping people bear their burdens, you're wrong. If you don't think that you need help, you're wrong. A Christian who's not interested in people helping them with their burdens or helping others with their burdens has failed to remember what Paul told us in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. A Christian who's not interested in burden bearing is no Christian at all. Because they failed to remember that at the very center of Christianity is the news that Jesus has done everything necessary for us when we could do nothing. That Jesus himself carries our burdens when we had been crushed by them. And because he carries our burdens, we can now carry the burdens of other people. Verse 4. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Is Paul saying here that we should boast in our own work? No, that's not what he's saying. He is saying that if we compare our work to our neighbors, we might actually be doing pretty good. We might actually be doing pretty good. But if we compare our work to what we just talked about, about what Jesus does for us, we'll recognize pretty quickly that we're not doing as good as we thought we were. And it's that comparison that cultivates within us a posture and an attitude of humility. And a reminder that we need help and we need to help others. We have to stay humble. Paul gives us a good reminder here in verse 5 though. He says, for each will bear his own load. He's saying that even though we need help in carrying our burdens, we are ultimately responsible for our sin. And so there's a tension that we have to manage. We can't just sit around and say, no one helped me. No one did anything for me. No, we must take responsibility for our sin. But that's why it's also of critical importance for us to be on the constant lookout of how we can help other people. 
When I'm telling people the story of my faith, when I'm telling my testimony, I talk about how I came to faith at a young age and how I was growing in my faith and then how my senior year here at EBC, we, we had some pretty significant challenges. We had some pretty significant things going on. And I talk about how when I really needed people to walk with me because I had become pretty arrogant, when I really needed people to bear my burdens and restore me because I had become pretty prideful, they were focused elsewhere. They were focused elsewhere. And in many ways, that was true. But it did kind of create this resentment in me toward the church. And not just this church, but all churches. And so when I went to Auburn, I I didn't get involved in church. I didn't get involved in church. I was just kind of in and out. And again, while in many ways that was true, the reality is the sin and the lifestyle that I chose because of that was my own fault. It was nobody else's responsibility but mine. Just because people don't help us doesn't mean that we don't take responsibility for our sin. I was every bit responsible for the sin in the lifestyle that I had chosen in reaction to a lack of burden bearing. And so we undoubtedly need people to help us carry our burdens, but we have to remember that God will judge us individually. Our actions, our motives, our heart. And so Christianity is both communal and that we grow together. You see it back here. It says grow together. It's communal in that we grow together, but it's individual and in that we will be judged. And I'll be honest with you guys, as I was preparing this message and I was thinking through, you know, what God wanted me to say, it finally hit me. During that time of EBC, I did nothing to help bear the burdens of other people. And I had to repent of that. I had, to, I had to wrestle with that. I had to repent of that. Because all this time I had been so concerned with how people didn't help me that I never once considered, did I actually do anything to help them during that season? And so you may find yourself in, in a difficult season in the church right now. And my encouragement to you is if you find yourself asking the question or making the statement, no one's done anything to help me, then you have to wrestle like I did and ask the question, have I done anything to help them? Have I done anything to help bear the burdens of those around me? And it's okay if the answer is no. But just like I did, we have to repent. We have to live differently. This church, this family, will only be as strong as we are willing to bear one another's burdens. We said that the main idea of this message is that Christ-like burden bearing leads to an abundant harvest. It leads to an abundant harvest. Verses one through five talk about burden bearing. Then we move into verses seven through 10 and we're gonna talk about the idea of an abundant harvest. But verse six is kind of interesting because it connects back up to verses one through five. It talks about sharing. And what does it say? Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. The teachers of the word should not be trying to attract people in gimmicky ways. That's not what their job is. Their job is to teach the truth of scripture and exhort the hearer to apply it to their life. It's the receiver's job to take the truth and do what it says. And so what Paul is doing here in this instance seems like he's trying to address a particular, inst- uh, particular issue to the Galatian churches. The Galatian churches, their teachers had needs. They had needs. And so that's what he seems to be talking about. But it's a good reminder for us because as a member of a church, it can be easy to think about what the people in the pews need. It can be easy to think about what the congregation needs and lose sight of the fact that the pastor or the staff member has needs as well. And I hope this doesn't come as a shock to you, and I don't think it will. Pastors aren't superheroes. Some of y'all are like, yes, we know, amen. (laughs) They're not superheroes. They don't have superpowers. They have needs. They have fears. They have doubts. They've got kid problems, marriage spats. Generally, everything that you're struggling with in your life, they are too. And so we need to be exhorted 
and reminded that we should, as a congregation, bear one another's burdens, but we also have to be reminded that you need to, to bear the burdens of the pastor because they're a part of the flock with you. The church leader, they're a part of the flock with you. And that can be super simple. That can be shooting them a text, hey, I'm praying for you. It can be stopping, stopping them in the hallway, hey, I'm grateful for all that you've done for us. They need that. They need that. And I know you guys are in the middle of a pastoral search. And, and so I want to encourage you, as you bring this new pastor on, do exactly what this is saying. Do everything you can to share all good things with the one who teaches. Because they need it. So we've talked about burden bearing here. Now we're going to move into this idea of an abundant harvest. An abundant harvest. What does verse 7 say? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The divine law is this. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. If you plant apple trees, what will you end up with? Yes, apples. It's good. If you plant corn, what will you end up with? Corn, it's not a trick question. You guys are smart. Never in the history of farming, as far as I know, has anyone ever planted peanuts and ended up with watermelon. It doesn't happen. That'd be some weird genetically modified food. Because what you reap is because of what you've sown. That's a good reminder for us. We know this. You guys already know this, but the, the reminder is that sometimes we get frustrated because we've sown to the flesh and we get frustrated that we're not reaping from the Spirit. One Bible commentator says there's only two fields that the Christian can sow to. They can either sow to the field of the flesh or they can sow to the field of the Spirit. Verse 8 says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Holiness is a harvest. Don't miss that. Holiness is a harvest. Jerry Bridges starts his classic book on the topic of holiness with an illustration of a farmer. And he, he says that the farmer's got to put in hard work. He makes sure that we know that. But the farmer's also got to depend on God for things that only God can do. What are those? Cause the sun to come up. Farmer can't do that. Cause the rain to fall. The farmer can't do, to, do that. Cause the seed to germinate. And Bridges goes on to talk about this idea that the farmer knows he's got to plow. He knows he's got to plant. He knows he's got to fertilize and cultivate. Because if he doesn't do those things, then when it comes time to harvest, there will be no harvest. But at the very same time, he's got to depend on God for what God will do. But if he doesn't put in the work, he won't reap the benefits. Bridges says this, Farming is a joint venture between God and the farmer. The farmer cannot do what God must do, and God will not do what the farmer should do. We can say just as accurately that the pursuit of holiness is a joint venture between God and the Christian. No one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life. But just as surely, no one will attain it without effort on his own part. God has made it possible for us to walk in holiness. But he has given us the responsibility of doing the walking. He does not do that for us. We said it earlier. Christ-like burden bearing leads to an abundant harvest. Emmanuel, if you want to see holiness and disciple making and salvation abound within this faith family, it's going to be because we have in partnership put in the hard work with God of bearing one another's burdens. Because Christ bears ours. It's interesting to me, and there does seem to be a direct correlation between our being willing to bear one another's burdens and seeing an abundant harvest. It's as if Paul is saying, if you want to see the baptismal waters full every week, it's going to be because you first cared for one another. So my question is, have you sowed to the field of the flesh or have you sowed to the field of the Spirit? 
are people from the outside looking in and saying, what they have at EBC is what I want. Are they saying something different? Have you taken care of one another? If I can just be honest with you, bearing burdens doesn't come easily to me. It's not something I'm naturally good at. I see the first sign of a burden, I think, ooh, that's going to require energy. I see, ooh, that's going to require time. I may have to change my plans. But I have to have the constant reminder that it's good. And I need to constantly and regularly go to God and ask him to make my heart the way that his heart is so that I see people the way that he sees people because it's then and only then that I'll lean in. And even though it's hard and it seems like there is a never-ending pile of junk that people are going through, verse 9 and verse 10 are an incredible reminder for us. They say this, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. What's Paul saying here? Don't give up. Don't give up. Even though it seems hard, don't give up. Finish through the line. Don't give up up. In 2016, Angela Duckworth, a psychology professor at the University of Pennsylvania, wrote a book titled Grit, which is a great title for a book. Uh, And in this book, she shows through various studies that talent and intelligence are not very good predictors of success. They're actually pretty bad. In fact, she shows that sometimes talent gets in the way of success. But what she does say is that grit is a good predictor of success. And what is grit? Grit is the combination of passion and perseverance. It's knowing what you want and working hard to get it. And so my question here is, what do you want for this church? Do you want to see the baptismal waters full? Do you want to see people come into salvation? Do you want to see people feeling loved for and cared for? And once you answer that question, you've got to move to the second question. Are you willing to put in the hard work in partnership with God to get it? If grit is necessary in the business world for success, how much more necessary is it for us to have a gospel grit for the sake of the kingdom of God? Emmanuel, don't grow weary in doing good. For in due season, you will reap the benefit if you do not give up. Let's just take a step back for a second and kind of just catch our breath. This has not been an easy season here. It's been a rough year. It's been a rough couple years. Some of you guys may have lost friends. Some of you have lost trust. In people, and you may find yourself right now asking the question, is it even worth it? Is it even worth it? Is it worth it to grow in personal holiness? Is it worth it to bear one another's burdens? Is it even worth it? Paul is clear, not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, you will reap the benefit. EBC, it is worth it. I love this church, and I love these people. And you might be asking yourself, how are we going to make it through? How are we going to make it through? Well, maybe today can be a turning point. If you've ever talked to a long-distance runner, they'll talk to you about this idea of hitting a wall. Hitting the wall. And what does hitting the wall mean? It means that your body is depleted of its glycogen. That's a really fancy way of saying it's depleted of its fuel. And when you've depleted your fuel and you've hit the wall, your mind just shuts down. If you ask a runner, they're like, yeah, all that happens is I just want to sit down and take a nap. Because you've become exhausted both physically and mentally. But here's what's crazy. When you break through that wall and your body gets the fuel that it needs... It is unbelievable how it will recover and you can run further and faster than you ever thought. 
You can run further and faster than you ever thought. But Ben, how can you be so sure that we can break through? Because you have the infinite God of the universe who can never be depleted fighting on your behalf. The Son of God left heaven and came to earth to live a life that none of us could live and die a death that we deserved. But EBC, the Son is not dead, the Son is alive. And because he lives, you know it. We can face tomorrow. Because he lives, you've heard it. All fear is gone. Because we know that he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. I want us to take a second. I don't just want to say these words. I want to sing them. I want to believe them. Here's the thing. If Jesus isn't alive, it's not worth it. But EBC, Jesus is alive. So if you guys want to stand with me, let's sing these words with one another. And then we'll finish. EBC family, you may be tired this morning. You may have not even wanted to come this morning. The enemy may have done everything that he could do to keep you away from this morning because he knew that if you were here this morning, you would hear that Jesus has done everything necessary for your salvation. And because he's carried our greatest burden, we can carry one another's. And so this morning, we want to do just that. We don't just want to pay lip service to it, but we actually want to carry your burdens. And so we're going to have some of our deacons and our prayer team down here this morning. And we want to carry your burdens to the feet of Jesus, to the only one who can do anything about it. And so I want to ask you, what is the burden that you came in here with this morning? And are you willing to let someone help you carry it to Jesus? Don't let your pride stop you this morning. Don't let your pride stop you. God has given us one another as a means of grace, as a gift to cry with one another, to walk with one another, to pray with one another. And so I want to encourage you to step toward Jesus this morning. And maybe you've realized for the first time today that you've never actually let Jesus do anything about your sin. And maybe today, for the first time ever, you want to receive what Jesus has done on the cross for you because he loves you. You know what it is that you need this morning. Maybe it's a procedure that you've got coming up in a few weeks. Maybe you need someone to pray with you because you've got that wayward child that you're just struggling to make sense of if they'll ever come back to the faith. Maybe it's you want to take a step toward Jesus and receive him in faith today. Christ-like burden-bearing is the only thing that will lead to an abundant harvest. Let's worship together this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you, Lord, for this body. I pray that you will unify us. Lord, help us lean on each other. That's why we're here, Lord. We're to learn from you, love you, and lean on each other, Lord. Just pray that you will be with us this week as we walk in honor and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon.